Welcome to Corning, everybody. I am here in the Pot de Bear class at the Corning Museum of Glass Studio with my awesome class. And they uh, requested this specific project, which is an inclusion project. So we have pre-fired bits that are included in the clay, and we're going to collaboratively pour a mold for you. So for safety's sake, I'm going to get my apron on so I'm not totally messy. Let's see if I don't ruin my mic. And here comes my, my helpers are coming. So anybody who's helping, I have gloves over there for you and brushes here. I'm going to start mixing the plaster up. Mask first. So we're using a 50-50 plaster, pottery number one plaster, 200 mesh silica mix. So a refractory mold. And as I'm mixing my plaster, you can start to see, maybe, if you can see in the overhead camera, that I have little bits of plaster floating on the surface now. So I have little tiny islands all around and then a slight crackling effect. That's finished. So before, while that's slaking, because I'm going to let it absorb the water, I'm just going to give this a quick turn and see if there's anything I need to fix. So I might go in with a little tool like this and just make sure that the clay is up around the edges of these inclusions so that I have a nice solid meeting place. And then if I make a tool mark, I might go back in with a small brush and just brush that out so that the surface is a little smoother. So that looks pretty good. So these are all pre-fired elements like this. And you can see these really sharp edges. So I cold work those off. I try to do all the cold working ahead of time. And because this was done a little bit uh, quickly, they're cold worked a little less than I would normally cold work them. I might like really smooth that edge out and make it nice. And then they're pushed pretty firmly into the clay and they're pushed in about a quarter of an inch to a half an inch. I want them to seat really solidly in here so that they're firmly in place so that when I'm building the mold, they're not gonna like fall out. Um, but I want enough glass on the other side so that as they fuse together, they're going to have space to really connect well to each other. All right, let's mix up this plaster. And anybody who wants to jump in, we'll do like two at a time. And what we're going to be doing is you're going to be taking the brushes mm -hmm. and the plaster that runs down here, you're going to get in there and you're going to start painting the underside of these. Will it adhere properly? I was wondering about that. It kind of goes on and drips off and goes on and drips off. And so it's, it's a bit of a task sometimes. And I used to always spray them with mold release. But I've actually found that when you spray them with the mold release, it tends to wick off even more. You could potentially try spraying it with um, hairspray, which mm -hmm. gives it a little bit more of a tooth and it might yeah. stick to it better, like when you do waxes. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried that? I haven't. Okay. I haven't run into it being so difficult that I had to do that. <clears throat> so I'll start by just pouring on the body. And you can see on this piece, I'm working on this turntable, which makes it a lot easier because I'm doing a lot of fiddly work with the 
inclusions, I want to be able to turn the work easily mm -hmm. to access all those points. Who's going to come get dirty with me? Yeah, jump on in. And just any of these brushes, or do you want some to stay clean? Nope. I have a little rinse cup here. Awesome. Yeah, come on in. And actually, if you come over to this side, you'll be able to get on there better. So yeah, just okay, yeah. Which, well, if you just kind of dab, and you can get on the points, and then we'll... The underside is the real challenge, and like this particular one is very hard because yeah. it is a really extreme angle, so it catches air bubbles. And you gotta make sure you don't get an air bubble underneath it. That looks great. So the idea as you build this model is to keep all of these visually accessible. You don't want to pour your mold so thick that they disappear. Because then when you go to divest, it's very difficult to get your mold material off without mm -hmm. breaking the inclusion off. True. So at this point, because it's getting a little bit thicker, you can mound it up a little bit on there. I'm going to turn it. There's like a little spot yeah. back here. Yeah, that one's the hardest <laughs> one. <laughs> this one is fun. Isn't it? <laughs> Just imagine some of those pieces where there's like 30 of them on there. You know, I, I got into one situation where I was alone. And I had, you know, all these things, and I finally just picked up the whole board and poured the plaster over it because yeah. I was panicking. And Does anybody else want to switch out? Yeah. Anybody? Anybody want to go? Kevin, jump on Yeah? Here. Here you go. All yours. <laughs> but as it thickens up, we want to just try and mound it up there a little bit. Mm -hmm. A thin layer is fine, because we are going to get a little bit more material the next time. And on the on the tips there, if you can kind of like almost drizzle it and dab, yeah, perfect. Yep. I'm going to start mixing up my next bucket. <clears throat> I'm going to hang on to it for a minute. I might need some more. Thank you, though. So I know we've all talked about this a little bit, but maybe other people don't know. Depending on the climate that you're in, your plaster will either set up really quickly or very slowly. Um, in here, we have a lot of air conditioning and a lot of humidity, so it takes a little bit longer for the plaster to set up. And in a way, in this situation, that's kind of nice because it gives you a little bit more working time. Now, you know, sometimes if it's very hot and dry, 
and you live in an arid climate like the desert, it actually might go off much faster and it kind of, you run out of time really quickly. I think, I feel like it's lemon juice that you put into your plaster to extend the working time, is that right? It's like you can add hot water to make the plaster go faster and I think it might be lemon juice you add to go slower. I don't remember totally. That looks great. I think at this point we'll call it quits and you can rinse your brush off in here. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> That's how we are here. We're all professional. <laughs> Uh-huh. Next. <laughs> exactly. So at this point in the process, you're just kind of waiting for the plaster to get to a more buildable moment. So right now, if you pull it up the side, you can see there's a slight texture. And it's just getting to the point where it's firm enough to really start building. But it's still pretty liquidy right now. For a mold with inclusions like that, yeah. would you uh, do more layers to your mold than what we've been doing? Sometimes I will, because to just get them covered, it's such a task in itself. The thing you have to be careful of are having really thin spots, then they tend to want to flake away from each other on subsequent layers. Mm. Um, the other thing that I haven't really done, but I, I've only done it once. If you have a lot all over the whole surface, you can put like 1% diatomaceous earth into your 50-50 mix and it creates a softer mold mix, as in it's much easier to divest after, afterwards, so it's more friable. So it wouldn't be the thing you would want to create structure, but if you had to pour over the top of many small ones, you might want to investigate something like that, a softer mold mix that could dig out more readily and would be less likely to snap off your bits, your bits and bobs. Isn't that right, Kevin? Bits and bobs? Bits and bobs. Bits and bobs. Yeah. <laughs> we've got a very, what we've got, uh, Eng diverse. English, yeah. uh, Israeli, and Cuba. Spanish. Yeah. Like a very nicely diverse class here from all over the world. We love that. Then we get to learn all the fun slang like bits and bobs. <laughs> That'll be the name of this piece, bits and bobs. All right, I'm just gonna let that sit for a minute and go over here. So this is one sample that I have with me and um, we haven't talked at great extent about this particular technique within the class. This is a really fun sort of example of this technique, but it's also an example of things that you might want, not want to do. So the placement um, in this particular vessel, this one is sort of flat. This one is more upright, and the placement of these is very near the lip. So it's very hard to get the glass packed around a hard pre-fired bit as opposed to your mold mm -hmm. without um, creating this loose excess here. And what happens as the glass melts, as you can see, there's all these little pinholes around it. 
not necessarily unpleasant, but if you're not planning for it, it's not pleasant. <laughs> so when you're planning on you know, using these, I generally now give myself at least an inch of space for working above, because then I can get a thicker coverage over the top of that. Because you know, these are smaller bits, and I have you know, various different shapes and sizes that I might use. Um, but on the other side, about this much is going to be inside your mold. Mm -hmm. So covering over that, it's a job to do. And then if you don't quite, so this was my very first ever experiment. And um, I was sort of chesting out enamels on this side. Mm -hmm. So this, these are enamel lines on the mold that then I put the glass over the top of. Mm -hmm. You can see this one tiny little peekaboo point. So it's the back side of the inclusion just poking out. So I didn't have enough coverage. You can look at that if you want. And would that make it more fragile, or essentially it's just kind of sad because? It's more of a visual okay. deterrent. <laughs> I tend toward that. <laughs> um, I'm very thankful for the people in my life, like my mom, who um, make me think about and embrace being a little bit more organic and viewing mistakes as possibilities instead of uh, bad things. <laughs> it's true, though. Sometimes you just need to change your perspective on something to sort of learn that it, there's more to the thing that happened that you weren't planning on than you might realize. And sometimes there's the best learning happens at those times. So I'm just building up right here around the lip. Now, in general, I hand build all my molds. And the reason I do that is because when I put this piece in the kiln, I'm at slightly lower temperatures anywhere from 1250 to 1450, which is pretty high. It's almost at the full fuse temperature. But I'm not there for very long. So I want the glass to melt, but I don't want it to kind of slump all down to the bottom of the mold. Um, where's my rinse bucket? Somewhere is a rinsing thing. So I want the heat work to be able to happen really quickly and really easily. And that happens a lot better if you have a thin mold. So the heat can penetrate on all sides very evenly. So now I need my next round of helpers. We've got a minute here, but we're going to apply a fiberglass coat. So this is the first coat. I have about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch. And on the second coat, I'm going to be applying this fiberglass mat. Now, as we apply it, we're going to dip it into our premixed plaster. And then we're going to sort of agitate it. So what I'll do is I'll start at the bottom, and then I'll work my way up. And then when I get to the inclusions, I'm going to be ripping off tiny little shreds and just wrapping them. I don't need them to be fully coated. But I am looking already at these little points here that you can see a little bit of glass. Now, if you leave that, what happens in the firing is glass, it doesn't pour out, but it like oozes out. And there's a little bloop. Um, what would you call that? Like a, a glass wart? I don't know. Yeah, it kind of looks like that. Yeah. Well, it definitely turns into that. So right now this is soft enough where I can steal some from the base here and go around. That would have been fun, right? <laughs> that would have been glorious. Curve to it 
that's you know, something I worked on. To you know, get. this is a corning special brush from the box, <laughs> so it's been sitting like this. But um, yeah, it's actually working out really well for me right yeah. now. I'm enjoying that I can build up on the ridges. And you can kind of see right now that the plaster is at this really nice consistency where I can kind of pile up on the ridges. Mm -hmm. It's giving me a whole new design idea right now. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So then I kind of get down and I look to see, you know, are my undersides totally covered? And the points, you know, these have pretty, pretty defined points on them. It's very easy for the liquid e-plaster to pull away from that point and expose the point. And that looks pretty good. You messed up it there. Oh, that's where I put it. I hid it from myself. No, 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 I got, I got it for you. Oh, you, thank you. <laughs> You're magical. Thank you. <laughs> now, my plaster is very slow to set up right now. Um, does somebody want to check really fast on the plaster bats and see if they're firm and dry yet? I think she's on it. I poured some plaster in the other room, the, the oh. test tiles. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So I might just fudge a little bit because this is a little slow. Normally, I'm going to wait for this to get fully firm before I start adding my fiberglass layer. This is a still a little bit. It's right there, almost firm, but it's not quite. Let's see. And we might need a runner for this now. Thank you. Thank you. We're not in our normal mold room, so we're running back and forth from our mold room to here just to Yours, but the other ones are these are not, mine? Uh, the other ones are not dry yet. So. They're not. Okay, interesting. Maybe it's something in the air today. <laughs> oh no, it's firming. Okay. It's just a little slower today for some reason. Maybe because it's colder in this room. So Steven, you got your gloves on? I'm ready. You're ready to roll? So it's going to be a little bit different because we're going over a softer surface than mm -hmm. normal. So when you put it on there, you're going to want to put it on gently. gently. Yep. And actually, if you come over on this side, you'll have better access. So do you want me to put this here? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. I'll take the first, and then I'll, or I'll give that to you. And I'll put this over here. So you see we dipped our fiberglass strips and then we're just kind of getting the excess off of there. And then you can see Steven's doing a really nice job of agitating it. And I'm going to go ahead and start ripping strips and applying here. And as I apply, I'm making sure to sort of massage it gently into the surface of the piece. And you can see the little bits that are starting to come up here. That's perfect. I'm going to let that wrap around. And you want to go in a pattern so that you're overlapping, 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 so you never lose track of where you are. 
And if you don't agitate the fiberglass, it tends to not lean over the, or not fall over the surface very well, and it kind of can trap air. So you want to make sure that it's agitated and that it's falling into all of the undulations that you might have on your surface. It's also why generally on the first layer, I'll keep that nice and sort of uniformly smooth. I have some texture, but not too much texture. You can see this is the original surface. I have a little ridge here, but there's no sort of cavities. Um, a naked point. That's what I thought. Yeah, I think I touched it. So make sure that the bottom edge is up so that it's not on the very plexiglass. Yep, exactly. Perfect. <clears throat> Does anybody else want to jump in and do some some fibering? Sure. So as I get toward the top, I'm really going to shred it so that it kind of looks like a hairy mess so that I can get around these points. It's getting pretty thick in there. Yeah, I know I might have to switch out and finish points. I'm going to finish the bottom part first because mm -hmm. I don't have my edge down there finished. So when you're pouring these molds, it's always an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of fiddly bits, and um, even right now, we're having this moment where uh, the material that's in the bucket is starting to set off. Like, I mixed it a tiny bit thicker because I could see that that first layer I put on um, wasn't setting up as quickly. So I overmixed a little bit, which is working, but now we're kind of running out of material. So do make sure we might, how are we doing in here? We've got a little bit left. So make sure it doesn't end up being wadded up and you're just getting, so if this is your bit, you're going to go down like that mm -hmm. and then just gently wrap around the tips and make sure that when you see that it mm -hmm. actually does have coverage, so like there's a naked spot, because the fiberglass and the glass mm -hmm. might actually oh, yeah, stick to really each other. Yes. <laughs> then you're gonna want to push against it, but not too much, because you know, like still soft enough to make it move inside. The yeah. Clay, right? Yeah. Well, uh, it's the clay. I let the clay actually get pretty firm. That's a good point, Chloe. Um, so she was just mentioning that you have to be careful to not push on the inclusions too much because they might wiggle within the clay. And that is true, but this clay, I actually let it get pretty firm ahead of time. So I placed the inclusions when the clay was medium hard, and then I went ahead and let it dry a little bit harder so that those inclusions were really firmly in place. So 
You also want to just take your gloved hand and rub like this. That makes sure that the fiberglass is really in there and it smooths out the exterior of your mold so it's easier to handle. I feel like that's pretty good. We're probably going to have to just put some on the tips. Yeah, I see that last one's a little. Yeah, it's really starting to set. Oh, thanks. <laughs> You can see how pouring molds like this by yourself is challenging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's, wow. it's nice yeah, to have tips. a mold, buddy. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna, I'll take care of the tips. Yeah. It's actually kind of perfect right now. It's huh. not too hard. It's it's close to close to freak out time, but not there <laughs> quite yet. Got a tiny bit here that I might like. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Little points. It's just got just a tiny bit of fiberglass. So you can see I can still see my individual points. They might start to get vaguely buried, but not too badly. There's a bare spot. Now there's nothing wrong, you know, at some point you call it quits with this. <laughs> and um, if you needed to, you could definitely pour another layer over the top of this. Uh, usually I would go ahead and do that with uh, the fiber glass just because it helps to adhere it. Yeah, there's a little spot right there. Ah, there. You got it? Thank yep, you. I, Thank well, you. I think I did. <laughs> it's perfect. It's beautiful. Okay. Any more of this? This is a nice blob. Maybe a little bit on this point. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is nice and stiff. Now. That'll be my job later. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So it's right now it's, it's starting to get to the point where you don't want to touch it anymore because it's stiffening up. And if you manipulate it too much, you start to cause damage more than you're actually helping the situation. So I'm going to go ahead and take my gloves off. And while this is drying, I'm going to show you a couple little patterning things with glass. This is my, my rinse bucket, because what don't we do at Corning or anywhere else? Put plaster in the sink. Um, it's generally a bad idea. <laughs> so I have some glass of various kinds, and I'm going to show you on these plaster bats. So we kind of use these little plaster bats basically as test tiles. It's a great opportunity to play with the colors. And my students nicely gave me some because I poured some and they weren't quite ready. So. One of the things, whenever I'm working on any of my pieces, whether that's a flat piece or a vessel, I'm going to be working on a moist paper towel. And the mold, I never give it the opportunity to fully dry out. And the reason for that is that it helps the glass to adhere to the surface if the mold is wet. If you think about two sponges side by side, a dry sponge and a wet sponge, and you dump a bunch of flour on top and turn them over, it's going to stick to one and not to the other. And the mold is my sponge. So there's my wet paper towel. And this looks really dirty, but it's, it's just a smoke and mirror situation. It's actually clean, plain water. So this is a freshly poured piece. 
And then mainly I'm using, um, in this adventure, I'm using Bullseye Powder and Bullseye 01 Fine Frit. And I'm applying with these tiny enamel sifters. So holding up here and sprinkling down, I get this really nice sort of gradated line. Now, the closer I get to my surface, the harder the line is going to get. You see the difference there. And then, generally speaking, I'm using some kind of paintbrush. I'm missing a paintbrush. Oh, it's right here. I did that to myself. <laughs> oh, thank you. So there's two main paintbrushes that I use. There's this kind of nice, soft nylon bristle, which is very soft. And then there's this bristle brush, which has a much firmer bristle. So this one is really great for picking material up, like that. And I'm kind of gently rolling as I go. I can also, and this is kind of one of my favored methods, push a line. But this does work really well with this brush. And the main difference between this one and this one is how it is on the mold surface. So if I do a lot of these back and forth movements like this, I'm actually slowly, slightly sanding the surface of my mold. Whereas this one, because it's softer, you get a little less of that plaster displacement. So also, this tends to smear the particles more, whereas this tends to pick them up better. So I call these my magic erasers, whereas these are my beautiful line makers. You can get these really delicate, beautiful lines. I think Owler was asking about the lines last night in the slideshow. So you can also switch to a smaller sifter, and you can get a different um, line style. So if I want to do these little tiny intricate lines, I think, Aller, you were asking about these lines last night? Yes. <laughs> so it would be something like this. And sometimes I take a lot of time to make the sifting really beautiful. In the case of the lines, I'm actually less careful because I like thinner and thicker parts. So you can see slight inconsistencies in this uh, sifting. When I'm working, I always have my tools, my rinse cup, and my blotter because depending on the kind of brush you have, it's going to hold more or less water. All of the nylon brushes tend to hold more water. So I'm dip, dab, dip, dab. There's a lot of dip and dab. So that would be typical of that kind of line. But I can even make it finer by having just a little less powder come out. So, and I might even hold it farther above the surface so I can get a little finer line. And it's a very soft touch at that point. And this color that I'm using is the Adventuring Blue, which is a really rich, deep color. And it's a great forward color. Um, it, I can put almost anything behind it, and they don't interact. Or you can still see the lines really clearly. So you can see how you get those very fine lines. And if you want to, you can continue to push the line past that little shade line. I love the shade line. But sometimes you just want a crisp line. And you just keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing the line. And then you just have this singular line that's very crisp and nice. Um, and we were talking about sort of using the darker colors 
in the foreground and backing it with the other interesting thing, if you do this a lot, is that you start really noticing and becoming aware of airflow. <laughs> so there's a little air vent over there, and I know that because my powder slightly goes to the side. So sometimes you're, you're kind of playing with whatever wind sources around you. Um, it's because I was like getting this other unintentional line. So just slowly sifting, I can blend that out. But there's a lot of really magical patterning you can do by just using one color and water. So that being said, here you have this, and then I can do splattering. And this is a really great way to sort of make like an antiqued surface. So you can see this beautiful design that's happening. And then you can also do the, the drip, which again can give you this really lovely surface. And if you were backing that with a red or another color, you get kind of an exciting thing to look at without tons of fiddly effort. Um, yeah. Another thing that's fun to do is, I'm just going to use one of these. You can get a small amount of powder and put water in it. Normally I might do this in a small little cup like this. And I'm going to use the bristle brush. The nylon brush is not good for splattering because it just doesn't have, it's, the bristles are too soft. Um, I'm going to load my powder up in there. So you're kind of rolling the brush around in there. And this color, even though it looks like it's white, it's orange. So I'm going to splatter the back. You could do this beforehand. You can do it after. You can get all these layers of different color. I, you know, Using like a red, an orange, a bright green, you can get those sort of rock lichen surfaces that are so exciting to me. I love rocks. Um, <laughs> so that is that. And then I think we looked at the, uh, I don't know if I have a name for the technique yet, but if you just powder the whole surface, And while I'm doing this, I'm going to multitask. Nice. <laughs> and you spray this and keep spraying. You'll start to see a sheen happen. And then if you start just moving like this in a rotational kind of way, you start to see that the water and the powder pull into each other in a very specific design. And weirdly, it happens every time. And again, it's a, it's a way to get a really cool design without sort of spending a lot of time doing line work if that's not your specific jam. All right, now that I've shown you that, we're going to see about divesting this mold. Um, we made a big mess. Normally, when I'm in the uh, mold room, I would scrape off the edges and kind of clean around here. And I generally work on a plexiglass board to pour my molds, and it's usually a quarter, is it the one fourth inch? Whereas this one is a bit thicker, so it's, a, it's great for transporting your piece around because it doesn't flex as much. It's less handy when you go to pop the piece off. So what I'm doing is I'm supporting one side and then just gently flexing the board over here. And that breaks the seal between the mold and the mold board. So I kind of work my way around. And then let's see what happens. I'll see if I can get it off. There's quite a bit of suction because of the clay and the stiff board. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> I'm like getting my core workout right now. <laughs> okay, once you get to the edge, you kind of break the seal. Now the thing about having all these is like, you can't set it down, right? So you kind of work on your side like this, but you get a good visual interior view here. And I'm just gonna pull this ring out. And, huh? One of those You know what I did forget was the, uh, the digging tool. Gotcha. Normally I would have a ribbon tool and I start thinning this to dig it out. Um, I might use my precious spoon for that for a minute before my digging tool arrives. Thank you. <laughs> so much better. Every job that is a nightmare can be made better by the right tool. <laughs> At least that's my theory. So what I'm doing is I'm thinning out that clay wall, and then I can kind of see better the where I'm at, and usually I can start to pull an edge out. Let's see. And I can see the bit of my first inclusion there. That's great. So this model is quite thick, so I'm probably going to have to dig out a little bit more before it wants to actually come free. And because the inclusions are stuck in there, it's kind of holding the clay in place. If the inclusions weren't in there, this form, it's basically open and kind of rounded, would come out really easily. So I just need like a little bit more wiggle room. I think it's gonna come now. Boop, there we go. So there you have a nice view of the inclusions in there. And at this point, I look for bubbles and I'll look for um, any clay blobs that are stuck in there and try and kind of get those off. So you can imagine on a vertical piece when you have inclusions sticking in that the underside is not visible to you. So I'll actually take a dental mirror and stick it in there so that I can see that underside because inevitably there's some clay stuck under there. The best helpers I have here. Thank you. <laughs> see, I didn't even ask and it just appeared. <laughs> that means, what are we, day three now? That means you actually have, you know what's going on right before it even happens. <laughs> this is a good sign. So now I'm, I'm doing two things. I'm washing the clay residue off of the mold. So you can clearly see the difference between the two sides where I've washed and not washed. But more importantly even, I'm washing off the glass. The clay will kind of get lodged in there and so it's a good time to wash it off because once you start packing glass over the top of that, it's in there and it's part of your piece forever. <laughs> So normally the washing process is actually pretty fast. It's only a little bit more time consuming because I have these fiddly bits in here. Or I should say these amazing spines. So it's almost done. 
Just getting off that last little bit on the rim. And I also want to make sure that this top rim is clean. And normally, um, I would be also taking a tool like this and, well, normally when I would clean my mold, I would have done some of this while the plaster was wet. But at this point, because I have all these sort of flaky flanges, I'm going to either pull them off or carve them off. The thing you don't want happening is you're working on your piece and this plaster chips off and it falls into your glass. You might see it and be able to, to get, get it out or you might not notice even that it happened and then again another thing that becomes part of your glass forever. So Let's see if we have enough here. We didn't have a ton of time to uh, prepare for this. So I'm going to flip this upside down and use the paper towels that are here. Um, I like these blue paper towels a lot because they're quite strong. And in my own studio practice, I reuse these paper towels over and over and over again. So once the piece is done, I wash them off, I put them up to dry, and then I'll just keep reusing them. Plastic wrap and tape, s'il vous plaît. So once I have my paper towels, I'm gonna fully immerse them in the water and then squeeze them out as much as possible until they're just damp. They're not soppy or anything like that. You just feel that they're moist. And then I'm wrapping my piece up. And this ensures that this mold will continue to have this moisture that helps the glass stick to the piece. Because you can imagine, especially as you start going vertical, if you don't have this moisture, the powder and the glass just want to peel away from the wall. Thank you. Cleaning, too. Will you come home with us? <laughs> OK, that's good. Um, <laughs> I have some friends who won't forgive me for the saran wrap thing. <laughs> But if I, you are using saran wrap, there's sort of some tricks you can do. You can use like a plastic bag or something a little bit thicker. But for this, I basically wear the saran wrap on my front. Otherwise, we all know it just turns into a big mess. And then I gently lay it down. Thank you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it over the lip of the piece. And this, this piece is an awkward shape, so it's a little bit more challenging sometimes to get the paper towel and the plastic all to cooperate at the same moment. So just a little bit of patience to get that over the top of the lip. And sometimes um, I'll even leave it wrapped slightly around the top lip, especially on something like this that has a bit of a thinner plaster lip on there, which again is not what would be probably normal for me. I would have about a cleaner lip here. So that's my first piece of tape. Now I can kind of go in a little bit and get this tucked down. Once it's on there and wrapped around the lip, you have a little bit of an easier time playing with it. And then I'm going to pull this over. And I kind of squeeze the air out and make it tight-ish. It doesn't need to be super tight. It's just to hold that little bit of moisture in. And when the mold is wrapped up well and then I usually will put you know another paper towel on top a moist paper towel with the plastic over 
you can have that mold and work on it for usually up to about six days and retain that original sort of moisture level. Now, I have to look at this and decide what am I going to do with it. Um, I see one tiny little bit more clay. Get that out. Okay. Now at this point, I think I might actually sit down. Normally when I'm at work, in my own studio, I have a chair that, you know, goes down and up, and I, I move it a lot depending on the angle at which I'm working. And I also would take uh, towels and create kind of a little nest for my piece. Uh, right now, I'm just going to hold this, and then I'll probably lay it on its side. So the first thing I'm going to do is... I'm going to create kind of a, almost like a spine area and a darker area around these green bits. So I'm doing blue, green, and orange, basically. So somewhat complementary, but also dramatic striking colors. I'm going to start at the top. And the one thing you'll notice that's different not only from what we've been doing, where we've been doing a lot of flatter things, you start getting into a vessel and you have to sift in a different direction. And then you have these inclusions and you have to constantly be sort of turning and moving. Did you use these? Yeah. Thank you. That's perfect. Dirty shop towels are the best thing ever. So you can see as I'm going that I'm having to angle. Um, wherever that sort of 90 degree angle happens between your inclusion and the piece, you end up getting this little white ridge. So I have to actually get the angle and turn it to cover that area. And I want to build it up pretty strong around these points because I want a really dramatic look. And then I'm going to leave the edge nice and faded so that I can create sort of more of a gradation. And you can see as I'm sifting, I'll just move back and forth, back and forth, and that's how I'm building up. I don't try to just do one area all at once because you end up with these sort of, it looks um, spray painted. So it's little passes just building up the material back and forth, back and forth, and turning to get those hard spots. This, those last two are going to be the most extreme angle. So I might have to turn it almost like this to get in there. So right now, I get the opportunity as the moisture soaks into your powder, you really get a clear visual on these darker powders of where you have really good coverage and where it might be a little thinner. So you can sort of go back and touch up those areas that might be a bit thinner if you're looking for real saturation. So I can see a couple areas here where I want to widen it out a bit. And you know, I might 
step back a bit and look at it and get a real clear view of what I want. So one thing you're always watching, too, is how much powder is in your cup. Um, when you start to get kind of uh, maybe like down to the last third or something, bless you, you start to get this shaped bit. So it looks like a half moon or a quarter moon. So you really want to try and always have your, your cup half full. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So at this point, what I'm doing is I'm going back and I'm working my edge. And I'm just going to create this nice sort of gradation shade line. And because it's, you know, a creature, it doesn't need to be exactly centered. I'm just going to do, I think we're almost at time. So I'm going to do a couple more little quick design passes and then call it. So I'm going to go out from the bottom. We've been talking about how um, symmetry is hard. <laughs> But a lot of what is symmetrical in life, like our faces, isn't really that symmetrical. So, you know, I've got a nice clear idea here, but it's probably not exactly on point, but I'm making a creature, you know? So I want it to be a little funky and weird. So I'm gonna go in kind of almost at the top of the edge and I'm going to start pushing my line. And then as I go out, then I'm going to keep thinning and actually removing material. And then I can go back in and remove. So the one thing I'm trying to do is I want this transition to happen, but I don't want there to be like a really blunt mark where it's, so I can either feather that out by re-sifting over it, or I just start out softly and then I come and redefine the line a little bit. And because I think I want to do sort of a dark, and then I want to do uh, orange to really accentuate that. When I push the line into itself like that, I'm actually rolling a rope of, there's a little rope of powder in there. And then I can come back with my other sifter and I can sift on top of that line. And it sort of piles up on top of that line so I'm going to do some removing, and but it's also going to be naturally darker there. I actually couldn't really see what I was doing because I was sifting this way. Normally, I'm sifting toward myself. But this way, I'm going to have this beautiful orange line that's very crisp against the blue. And of course, when you're using frets, it looks white but it'll turn a very brilliant orange like this when it's fired. Okay. So we're at five past. Um, do we want to keep going or what's our timeline? You can keep going if you want. Anybody? We can edit. Sure. I'll just go a little bit more. Do a couple lines.
that was a better sift this time. It's a little less material. You don't really need that much of these really bright colors to get an intense saturation. And always at the tip, I sort of pull it out so that it gets a nice sort of tendril feeling to it rather than being, um, you know, a hard, blunt edge. Mm -hmm. I think we actually should probably call it because we're at lunch now. Thank you so much for joining us today, mm -hmm. and I hope you enjoyed that. And hopefully maybe we'll be able to kind of finish this and throw it in the kiln and then post a picture of it so you can check it out in its finished form. Thank you. Thank you.